Hi there, I'm Valerie Francis. My guess is that you have limited writing time. And since you're here, you're curious about story theory and how it can help you write a story your readers will love. Well, I have good news for you. No matter what your current skill level is, if you're ready to deepen your understanding of how stories work, the Storytelling Fundamentals webinar series might be for you. These 90-minute sessions are laser-focused on the topics you need most. I'll be covering everything from developing characters we love to how to write a page-turner. My specialty is helping authors like you put theory into practice. Don't wonder whether your story is working. Use these tools to know that it is. For more information, go to valeriefrancis.ca slash webinars, and I'll see you there. If you want to write stories your readers will love, there are three things you need to do. Understand storytelling principles, see how other writers have applied those principles, and then use them in your own work. Here on the Story Nerd Podcast, our goal is to demystify story theory. We'll help you with the first two steps so that you can get started with the third. I'm Melanie Hill, writer, editor and poet, and I have a passion for spy stories, fairy tales and master detective novels. And I'm Valerie Francis. I'm a writer and literary editor, and I focus on stories by, for and about women. On today's episode, Valerie pitched Wally so that we can study empathy. This 2008 film was directed by Andrew Stanton from a screenplay that he co-wrote with Jim Reardon. Now, of course, there will be spoilers because we can't talk about the movie without talking about the movie. And we'd really love it if you could give the show a rating and review. For Apple Podcast listeners, you can do it right from your phone. Simply go to the show's landing page and scroll to the bottom. It's that simple. All right, Valerie, what have you got for the genre this week for this movie? Well, I think the global genre is a courtship love story and the secondary genre, worldview maturation. How about you? Yep, I have exactly the same thing. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> Compared to last week, we've got a genre. This is good. <laughs> We're recovering. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm really interested to see what you think and how you think empathy was uh, created in Wally. So what have you got? All right. So the whole idea here is that we've got to get our readers to empathize with our protagonist, right? That is a minimum. They can empathize with other characters too. And we saw that last week with Manchester by the Sea. But empathy with the protagonist is a bare minimum. Now, empathy means like me. So in other words, the reader or the viewer in this case recognizes something in the character, something about that character rings true. Yes, uh, the reader can recognize the literal experience of the character for sure. But when we're talking about empathy and creating an emotional connection, that's not the priority. That's not the goal. If it was, then, you know, for example, if you were writing a story about a cardiac surgeon then only cardiac surgeons would be interested in your novel or your film. So although, yeah, there may be a shared experience, what we're after with empathy is a shared emotional experience. So the question then becomes, what if the main character doesn't have any emotions <laughs> or doesn't experience human emotions? Well, that's when writers anthropomorphize the protagonist. We see this all the time in kids' movies and books, and we do it with our own pets. At least I do. Wally is obviously a robot. And I chose this movie because I knew that Pixar had anthropomorphized him. And, you know, I'm doing it right now by referring to Wally as him. But I wanted to take a close look at exactly how they did it. What characteristics did they give him that enabled a human audience to make an emotional connection with a robot? Okay, so there's a physical representation of Wally and an emotional representation of Wally. Let's look at his physical presentation first. This is an animation. So obviously, the way Wally is physically represented is important, right? It's a film. Now, it's not likely that we'll be drawing literal pictures for our readers, although we could, depending on what type of book you're writing. But we are all describing them. 
So through our words, we're drawing pictures on the screens of our readers' minds. So for that reason, I think there's value in examining what Wally looks like and what he does. So let's just start there. One of Pixar's little tricks for making an emotional connection with an audience is to give the protagonist really big eyes. Wally is no exception. His eyes are actually binoculars with eyelids. We've seen this in cartoons for years, but the eyelids, the way we see them, they're always those of the human standing behind the binoculars. So the fact that Wally has eyelids suggests that there's a human in there somewhere. The outer shape of the binoculars, they droop downward. They're kind of like a basset hound's eyes. So Wally looks a bit sad and pitiful, uh, and he is also triggering in our subconscious mind the notion of a dog, not just any dog, but a puppy, a basset hound puppy. Even children who don't like dogs, who are nervous around them, will connect to these eyes. They are not threatening. Wally has arms with hands, and he even has thumbs. He doesn't have legs or feet, but he moves his tracks as though they're hind legs of a dog. Like we see them, we see him raising the track and sort of shaking it, like like a dog shakes his back legs after it comes in from, um, you know, rain or something like that. So I've said in past episodes this season that empathy is not sympathy, and that it doesn't matter whether our main character is likable or not. And that is true. But when the main character is a robot and we fear robots to the extent that they might take over, it's crucial that the audience like Wally and not be threatened by Wally. So that means that the filmmakers had to really pull out all the stops. This character cannot be perceived as one of those threatening robots. That's why they have so many puppy references. You know, his eyes, the way he moves his tracks, I just said. And there's a point later in the movie where he even bounces around like a happy puppy. And I have a puppy right now, so I totally recognized all of the moves and the tilt of the head and all that kind of stuff that puppies do. Robots, or androids more specifically, scare us when they're too much like us or when they appear sentient or when they're presented as having independent thought. And with AI going on right now and all the discussion about AI, this is what's really freaking us all out. So there's a delicate balance to strike here, right? How do you anthropomorphize a robot in a way that is non-threatening and not scary? Well, you portray him like a puppy. He's not only young, but he's innocent. But you don't stop there. The animators have made Wally small And in terms of social status, he's very low. He's a glorified Roomba. He's our servant and he's there to clean up after us. He's not a mischief maker. He has a job to do and he does it. So, so far, so good, right? Now, more, well, I was going to say importantly, maybe it's not more importantly, certainly more interestingly for as far as I'm concerned, there is an emotional presentation of Wally he has a personality, right? So what is that? Well, this, in my opinion, is where the storytelling really shines. Creating empathy and an emotional connection is the number one priority in any story. And it really shows here. So in like, I don't know, the first five minutes or so, here's a list of what we find out about Wally. He's alone, which makes us sad for him, but it also means he's less threatening because even if he were to become aggressive, we can handle one robot, surely. He has a friend whom he cares about. He doesn't leave Hal behind, Hal the cockroach. He changes his tracks so that Hal's ride on him is smoother, right? Because the little cockroach is bouncing all over the place on these nubbly little tracks. Wally is interested in things. He is curious. He's hardworking. He's happy, as is suggested by the type of music that he is listening to. For that matter, he is listening to music. He enjoys music. Now, he doesn't seem to have ears. We don't see ears, but he nonetheless is listening to music. And it's not just any music. It's show tunes, which I love. And while he is singing, he has made a home for himself and Hal. He collects things that he cares about and he organizes them. He uses a lunchbox, like it's a lunch cooler like construction workers use. He watches TV. 
So all of these things make him quote unquote human to us. And so far we like him. That's great, but it's not yet empathy. Empathy kicks in at about the seven minute mark when he's watching TV at his home and he sees the man and the woman holding hands. We realize in that moment that Wally is lonely. Poor guy. He has no one to hold hands with, so he links his own little fingers. I don't know what else to call them. They're not fingers, but you get my drift. He links them together. He has to hold his own hands. Then we see him put himself to bed. And just to drive home the idea that he's young and innocent and lonely, we see him actually rock himself to sleep. Oh, poor little Wally. Loneliness is exactly what made us empathize with Melvin Udall in As Good As It Gets. It's the same trick that Gail Honeyman uses in Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine. It's used often and it works every time because humans are pack animals. We exist in and we need families and communities. The importance of relationships and of being around other people was really highlighted for us during COVID. We were isolated from each other and it was really hard. So we get it. We know what it feels like to be lonely. It's an awful feeling and it resonates with us all. Now, this is all happening in just the first few minutes. But the filmmakers don't let up. They are relentless. They really, really, really want us to empathize with Wally. Then we see that Wally isn't a morning person. <laughs> right? He, he, he needs, we need coffee. He needs to go up and get his batteries charged in the sun. He gets scared when he thinks that he has hurt Hal. He has a sense of humor and he's playful. Like he puts the bra over his, you know, eyes, his binocular eyes. He plays with the, the paddle and the, the ball. We already know that he's a caring soul because we saw him care for Hal. But then when we see that he has a crush on Eva, well, that's a, another level of empathy because she is clearly out of his league. He is, she's way out of his league. Wally respects nature and he handles the shoot that's, you know, that he finds very gingerly and with care and with respect. So the list just goes on and on and on and on. This is all in the first few opening minutes. This is before the story even really gets going. So the inciting incident is when Wally meets Eva. We see him in physical danger when the ship is landing. We see that he's afraid because he's shaking and he's shaking the way, like in that same way that puppeteers use uh, when they want the puppets to look like they're afraid. Even though like intellectually, we know that if the ship were to crush Wally, he wouldn't feel anything. He's a robot. Nonetheless, because the filmmakers have already gotten us to connect with him emotionally, we feel anxious for his safety. We're no longer seeing a bunch of metal. We're seeing an innocent, young, loving puppy. When Eva's introduced, we see a slick, beautiful, streamlined robot. Wally then kind of looks nerdy next to her, right? And, and we all know that Eva's way outside his league. She's athletic and she's even ruthless. She becomes the antagonist. She poses a threat to our kind-hearted hero. And she even tries to kill his best friend, Hal. Even still, Wally is so lonely that he follows her around and he tries to make friends. And eventually he succeeds and we're happy for him. So that means when Eva is taken away, we're sad. Because we know what that feels like. He is such a good little guy and, and we, we see ourselves as good people. We want him to live happily ever after because we want ourselves to live happily ever after. So by the time the first act is over... The filmmakers have got us hook, line, and sinker. We are in for the long haul in this movie. Now, the first act is also called the beginning hook. Its job is to hook the audience. Hook them with the story and hook them with the emotion. Wally is a terrific example of both. Every decision that the filmmakers have made from genre choice to character design is made with the intention of hooking the audience and holding them right to the very end. It's about a lonely protagonist who falls in love, exactly like as good as it gets. And because we empathize with Wally, we're interested in his story. We want to know if Eva will ever love him back and if they will live happily ever after. Now, I have said many times, and I'll keep saying it, 
that nobody will care about what's happening unless they care about who it's happening to. Now, that's not my idea. I, I read it somewhere along the line. I wish I could remember where I read it. I can't. If I ever come across it, I will happily give the person credit. Um, but I remember that when I saw that, it was a light bulb moment for me. The events of Wally, like the plot line, is one we've seen a thousand times. We know, we know what will happen. But we're invested in it anyway because we care about Wally. We might have seen that love story a thousand times, but we haven't seen it happen to Wally yet. And that's the whole point. We're there because we care about Wally. We want him to be happy. And this is what happens when a story has been really well written. There's nothing fancy here. There's no new tricks. It's all the, it's the principles of storytelling put to good use. So that's all I have to say about empathy this week for Wally. Uh, Melanie, what did you come up with for stakes? Well, the stakes were, again, not what I expected this week. So I'm learning a fair bit about stakes and it's going against, um, it's challenging me and my expectations, which is a good thing, right? It's uh, And it's good to come and share it with um, on the podcast. But we, it's the way things present in this movie is really interesting and fascinating for stakes so we see the larger picture of what's happened presented first so you know the earth has been covered by rubbish and cruise uh, cruise like spaceships um, were launched to ensure the continuation of the human race while the wally units clean up so the starships look pretty good when compared to the state of the earth so without even seeing a person in the first five minutes of the film it's a pretty easy it's pretty easy to guess that the human's object of desire is to stay on the spaceships and not deal with the consequences of their pollution so but what's at stake for them well probably nothing at this point or nothing that we see but at the 7 minute mark one of Wally's objects of desire is presented by a musical romance right and he's also at this stage befriended a cockroach and that's how lonely he is right he's befriended a cockroach of all insects that's the one he's befriended oh now right so Valerie you've already mentioned how the creators have given Wally human characteristics right and you know how they've created a, a feeling of empathy for him because he is alone and he's in a dump and he's surrounded by garbage so, you know, the, uh, the environment is also really extreme and unpredictable. And we've also seen how Wally is really nostalgic for the past. You know, that's why he watches romances. You know, he collects old things from the rubbish that he then organises. So Wally is a collector of old stuff as well. And he uses those things that he collects to copy the humans in the movies that he that he sees. Now, then he finds the plant, right? And we know how precious this little piece of green is. And so we guess at this point that Wally's object of desire is to connect with living things. But what's at stake for him at this point is nothing because apart from the cockroach and the plant, there is nothing for him to connect with. So is Wally's life going to be less or more fulfilled if he doesn't make a connection at this point of the movie? Well, probably not. But then Eva arrives and Eva has a job to do and she goes about doing it. But Wally is fascinated by Eva and wants her to notice him. And eventually she does. And now the stakes for Wally start to materialise. He's not lonely anymore and he starts to share his world with Eva. But she hasn't studied the subtleties of human nature like him. And it's like when you introduce someone new into your environment and it means that, you know, that they can upset the very, the very normal that you have created for themselves because they're an element of chaos. So that's what happens. Eva actually starts to come into his world and come into his environment and upset the status quo of Wally's life, which 
he didn't anticipate. And so even wanting that connection comes with risks for him. Now, it's, it's a, I think it's a really fascinating play on the subtlety of how the stakes work in this movie. So where good things happen, but also the negatives of those things are happening at the same time. And this repeats itself quite regularly through this, through this movie. Now, when Eva finds what she's looking for, it does two things. It removes Wally's first robotic connection and it links Eva's mission to the evacuated human race. And by following Eva to the parent ship, Wally learns to negotiate a whole range of relationships. Now, on the spaceship, a possible future is presented as a consequence, right, of an uninhabitable Earth. So we learned that 700 years have passed um, (laughs) since they launched their first five-year cruise. So the consequences of 700 years in space have resulted for the humans in a loss in bone structure. So that is the humans have evolved into kind of blob-like creatures, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I find that so funny watching those people in this and they can't walk. I just, that makes sense, but I'd never thought about that before until I saw this movie. Anyway, that's a bit of an aside, sorry. Right, so, you know, Eva's discovery has now increased the stakes for the blobby humans on the spaceship. They now have something that is an alternate to what they've actually got. So the question gets posed of will they return to Earth if plant life is confirmed? But it's not the humans who understand what this means for them, right? It's actually Otto, the robot, who understands and he, that robot, doesn't want to go back to Earth. Now, so I'm switching between the two storylines here because it's kind of how it plays out in the movie. So you know, hopefully you'll be able to, to keep step with me. Being on the Axiom provides Wally with an opportunity to learn about people and robots, but it also puts his existence at risk because he's a foreign object. By moving Wally into a different world, the writers have put Wally's existence at risk, but they've also given him exactly what he wants, and this has created a lot of conflict in the film. So, Otto the computer is revealed to be the antagonist and this robot wants to stop the humans from returning to Earth and he shows the captain how Operation Cleanup has not worked and that life on Earth is unsustainable and the order of do not return to Earth is given and Otto is a big believer or or an obstacle to trying to return to Earth because he takes that order very literally. Now, there is a significant shift in what's at stake for the humans after about one hour, you know, when Eve returns and gives the captain the plant, proving that life on Earth is viable. And it's the captain that wants to return home and experience life on Earth. He wants to be human. And this is where he clashes with Otto, who wants to remain on the ship doing whatever it can to to be in space. So up until that point though, the occupants of the Axiom have just been existing in their chairs. That is life as they know it. And the captain, in the meantime, has been learning about life on Earth as it was 700 years ago. And he has started to understand what living is. Now, I noticed at the beginning of the movie that Wally didn't have anything at stake before Eva arrived. You know, Wally wanted connection, but until Eva arrived, there was that connection wasn't possible. But when she did come, then the stakes were introduced. The humans on the Axiom are in the same situation. They don't know what it's like to be human on Earth. But when the captain does, then being human becomes the stake for the actual humans on the ship. Now, this made me really think about likelihood and how it is important for stakes. The audience must know that positive and negative outcomes for the characters are likely 
And until the options of missing out or gaining the object of desire are present on the screen, then stakes don't exist. We saw this in 10 Things I Hate About You, but it didn't really become obvious until I saw the pattern repeated twice more in Wally. So for Wally, it makes sense to set the movie up this way. Wally's loneliness is introduced first so that when Eva does turn up and Wally forms an attachment, it's easier to relate to. And the same for the humans on the axiom. Their physical blobbiness makes more sense if they don't know about human activity on Earth. So when they do see what Earth could be like, it provides them with the motivation to return. Now, before I finish up, I found the switch between Wally's object of desire to Eve of fascinating. There is a point where Wally's object of desire is achieved, but in the end, it's Eva who nearly loses Wally. If the connection Wally craves wasn't reciprocated, then the story may not be complete. Therefore, it's really important for Wally's object of desire which is to be connected and in love, to be returned by Eva. So that's my wrap or my take on the stakes in Wally. So Valerie, what are the action steps for today's episode? All right, it's a quick one today. I don't think that's a reflection on poor writing for Wally. It's just that it's a kid's movie and therefore everything has been simplified. If we think about, uh, you know, Manchester by the Sea, for example, which we did last week, we could have talked about that for days and days and days because it, there's just such a depth to the storytelling because Wally is for kids who have a limited life experience to draw from. The storytelling is simpler, but it's still solid, which is really interesting. And it's something for us to remember and, and to, to emulate. It doesn't have to be fancy storytelling. What it has to be is solid storytelling and it will still resonate with your reader, your audience it will still hook them. It will still engage them. All right. My action step. I want everyone to watch three movies this week. Random movies. Just pick whatever. Watch the first 30 minutes, which should be roughly act one. Then pause the movie and ask yourself whether you care about the protagonist. If so, why? If not, why not? All right. Well, that wraps it up for this week. Join us again next week when we discuss Operation Mincemeat. To support the show, please leave us a rating and review and tell your writer friends about us. For access to writing templates and worksheets and more than 70 hours of training, subscribe to Valerie's Inner Circle by visiting valeriefrancis.ca slash inner circle and follow her on Twitter and Instagram at Valerie underscore Francis. If you'd like to get my tips about books to help you read like a writer, Visit me on Facebook and Instagram under Melanie Hill Author or find out more about me at melaniehill.com.au. And remember, story theory doesn't have to be difficult. It's a tool to help you write more, not less. So take it one step at a time and have fun. Mm-hmm.